All right, everyone. Welcome to day two of Type. And let me give you a very warm welcome to the youth track. I'm so happy that you're all here today to join us for our first presentation of the day and the first block of the day, which is the personal journey block. And I'm very, very pleased to welcome today Eliana Fu, oops, there we go, who will be the first person to speak today on our personal journey panel. She is the industry manager for aerospace and medical for Trump. Will present be presenting a presentation called "My Personal Journey." So, Ellie, I just gave you permission to come up onto stage. So, feel free to turn on your camera and mic, and let's kick things off strong. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Maddie. Hi, everybody. It's so great to hit, be here. Um, the second day of the Type Conference. I'm super pumped. I'm amped. I'm going to give you um, a quick. Um, insight into my personal journey into AM, excuse me a sec, and I'm going to bring up my presentation. So please forgive me because my screen does something funny. So where I do presentation mode on uh, Remo, Remo disappears. So you can still see and hear me, but I can't see you. So if you save your questions to the end, um, Maddie can help with that. So here we go. Okay, so this is my personal journey. Um, yeah, I'm Eliana Fu from Trump, um, but everybody calls me Ellie, so that's fine. And um, I'm just going to break this down into an agenda. I love to start my presentations with agenda um, because I wanna let people know what's coming up. So this is gonna be the who, the what, the why, the when, and the how. I mean, you could kind of like move those around into, um, uh, a different uh, order, but I kind of like to do it a bit chronological. So I'm going to kind of give you um, a brief glimpse into my career, and my life history. So uh, I hope that's okay. So the who, who am I? Um, I'm actually from London. You probably can tell by my accent, but I've been living in this country since 2007 when I came here with my, my green card. I will get to that part of the story later on. I have a US passport now. So, um, but I still have my UK passport just in case anything happens. I, um, I haven't had to use it lately, but I've got a lovely picture of the city of London, which is where I grew up. If you're very familiar with London at all, um, actually, if, you, uh, if you're if you familiar with sports, um, Wembley Stadium, I, that's kind of where I, I grew up. So, hey, Ellie, real quick, your PowerPoint's actually not on stage just yet. Oh, no, really? You your screen with us. Yeah, that way we can see where you all grew up. Um, that's, that's what I forgot to do. Sorry, my bad. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Apologies for interrupting you. Oh, no, no. That's all okay. So let me see if I can go back. Yeah, sorry, guys. It was um, a bit of a uh, faux pas on my point. Anyway, um, so I, I, I've got these wonderful pictures of Star Wars and Star Trek and all those things because I want to let people know that I'm a big nerd. I am uh, unashamed of that, but I grew up watching things like Alien. I saw um, Star Wars when I was five. I saw Alien when I was seven, so that really dates me. And I grew up with things like The Bionic Woman and um, Six Million Dollar Man and, and Doctor Who and all those kind of shows. So I think what that tells about my personality or things that I like is that I love spaceships or I love things stories about outer space I like um, stories that are inspirational and so those are the kind of uh, role models and things that I I take um, into parts of my life and so the curiosity the exploration the questioning why why do we do this why why is something like the way it is and the, the other questions which are how can we make things better so in my mind i'm going to steal a line from the company philips but um engineering is the application of of science to make things better so their motto is let's make things better and that how i've been as an engineer in my life i've always tried to live up to that kind of expectation but um, one other thing I think you might notice is, you know, my my science fiction role models, obviously, 
Uh, Ellen Ripley was like a huge uh, influence of my life as a very sort of strong, dynamic female character. But other people who were big influences on me were like Mr. Spock, um, because he was also logical, questioning, and he found everything fascinating. So uh, that kind of tells you uh, the kind of personality that I'm, I've been molding into. <laughs> So the what, the what for me is my background, which is material science and engineering. So I studied um, material science in my first degree at Queen Mary and Westfield College in London. And then I did my master's and my PhD at Imperial College. So here's a lovely picture of Imperial College. Um, you know, it's uh, basically the degree course used to be called metallurgy. But because that's not seen as being trendy enough or encompassing enough, actually, it has to also include polymers, ceramics, glasses, composites, biomaterials and things like that. So I think if you are interested in that kind of subject matter, material science can stretch across a whole bunch of different subjects. And how I first learned about it was um, when I was in high school. And I was trying to choose what kind of college courses I was uh, interested in. I actually got a flyer from one of the colleges and it had um, studying material science on it. And I didn't know what material science was. And it had a, a picture of a tennis racket, a golf club and then an aircraft. And then I was like, oh, duh, material science is stuff. It's stuff that things are made out of and everything is made out of something else. And then it, it sort of clicked for me, hey, that's really cool. That's an interesting thing to, uh, to study. And so, you know, back in those days, um, all I knew was the traditional, I want to say, focus on metals working world. And so that would be based on the ancient art of blacksmithing, which has been with us for thousands of years. Um, but, you know, in more modern forms, forging, casting, sheet metal and things like that, and really understanding all of those basic fundamental processes like welding, brazing, all those things. So the why, why did I get into that? Well, you know, I have that curiosity, that innate curiosity. Um, I really like the learnings and so on. And so I kind of focused in on titanium as my specialty. Um, it was kind of assigned to me. I didn't really choose it. But once I started learning about it, I just thought, wow, that is a fantastic engineering material. It's got to be one of the most interesting things to study because it's as strong as steel, but half the weight. It has all these great properties, like it can be used in the body with no um, yeah, sort of uh, deleterious effects on allergies and things like that. It can be made into golf clubs, it goes into aircraft, it goes into consumer products like eyeglasses and things like that. So, you know, um, those are kind of things that I'm really interested in. And then here, of course, I'm demonstrating my titanium headband, which is probably uh, this is my riff on Kim Cattrall's headband from the movie Star Trek Six. Um, she actually had one made out of aluminium, but mine is titanium. And so that's uh, it's pretty cool because it's got forming and it's also got heat treating and it's also got anodizing in, in one product. So that's probably um, a unique headband that I don't think anyone else has. But that's the kind of thing that I was interested in. And so I'm going to be completely open and share some personal information with you, which is most people don't want to share personal info. And that's cool. But I don't mind doing it. Um, so at the end of my studies, my my parents got a divorce and then um, I had to quickly get a job that paid a lot, a lot of my my loans and debts and things. Um, so I got a job at Merrill Lynch, which um, didn't really last for long because I didn't like it. <laughs> And so I tried to find a way to go back into, um, by the way, that job paid all my loans off. So I was cool with that. But the actual work I, I didn't find interesting. So um, I decided, well, what's the easiest way to try to get back into the world of engineering and science? And that is to do a postdoc. But little did I know that postdocs are usually kind of a bit low paid. So I did one postdoc at uh, Loughborough University in the UK. And then I went to Clemson in South Carolina. And with that, I had a work visa. And there I just worked on titanium because it's the best engineering material in the world. 
And so that's the kind of thing that uh, really drove me. I, I got all over my culture shock of moving from the UK to the US and learning to drive on the other side of the road and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah. But now I'm going to share some even more personal information with you. I actually uh, left the university to join a company because um, I got a boyfriend and their fiance and uh, we were going to live the American dream. You know, we were going to get married and get a house and then do all that sort of stuff. And then there was an absolute disaster. So the company underwent a 25 percent headcount reduction. So that meant that they laid off lots of people for economic reasons. And um, I wasn't uh, I wasn't uh, the only casualty. But because I had a kind of a special case because I still had my UK passport. So and then my fiance was also European. So they said, well, we're going to give you a unique opportunity to carry on working for the company, but in Sheffield, UK. And so that top image represents what I thought Sheffield, UK was back in at that time. But it, what it also meant was um, if I do that, I will lose my work permit. So work permit will go away. I will lose my chance of living in the US. I will lose my house. I have to sell my house. And then all my American dreams are just going to be thrown into tatters. But that's what happened. And then when I got to the company in Sheffield, uh, what happened was they said, hmm, in order to for you to have a job, we're going to have to get rid of somebody. And then he's going to have to train you before he leaves. So that was a terrible situation where, uh, I mean, and this top picture, this image sort of represents exactly how I felt about everything at the time. You know, it was, it was like I couldn't get any any worse in my life, you know, like my wedding was cancelled. And then my fiance never wanted to talk about rescheduling it or he never wanted to talk about that ever again. So that caused like a huge sort of personal rift between us and then it never got any better and then in the end you know we inevitably broke up but then I was in therapy for years <laughs> and so I can laugh about it now but um, it, that also brings to mind you know the topic of conversation that a lot of people had in the year 2020 about mental health and then I am a big fan of getting professional help or therapy or any other things that you do to help yourself because there's no shame in it because what it does is it provides you the tools to get better and to chart a new course for yourself so that's kind of what I did I mean I can't yeah all these horrible things that happened to me I lost my I lost my work permit I canceled my wedding I had to sell my house I had to put my wedding dress on eBay all those things yeah disastrous and then I was in therapy for months but um, anyway, what I, I did do is I was able to find a pretty nice position. Um, one, I did a, a temporary job working at Firth Rickson, which is um, no longer there. But it was then, uh, then um, one of the primary forging companies in the world, actually. And uh, their specialty was forged and rolled rings. Um, a lot of the products were for aerospace. So that's where I really started to understand things about manufacturing, the process, what it takes to make these parts. And um, actually, my desk was right over the hammer shop. So whenever the hammer would blow like this, everything would shake and then my Excel spreadsheet would go on and off. And then um, so that was kind of fun. And then one time I saw a ghost. So uh, don't laugh. I do believe that ghosts are real um, and they are it's because that work work site was uh, built over the site of an actual um, park gate of a manor house back in the day. And then after that contract ended, I found a job at TWI in Sheffield. So that's the Welding Institute. And um, I started working on uh, I do actually joined the laser and sheet processes group, even though I was not a laser person, they said, that's okay, you can still come and uh, work for us because we have a project on forging that was uh, funded by the EU and Yorkshire Forward. 
And the idea was to help companies in depressed areas where manufacturing has gone from traditional and is struggling now. And so the idea was to give them projects that they could do, um, funded by the EU and the UK government, um, to bring them up to advanced manufacturing and things like laser welding, uh, advanced uh, uh, subtractive processes, and also 3D printing. So that's where I first started to hear the name Trump, uh, because all, nearly all the lasers that uh, TWI had in those days were Trump, except for IPG fiber laser that they used on some 3D printing with blown powder. But I didn't know what 3D printing was because I was working on forging. So I was like, I wonder what those guys are doing over there. Hmm. Come back to that thought and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that later on. So anyway, fast forward to the year 2007 and I actually got a green card and I'm not going to say no to that. So I can restart my American dream and come to the U.S. And so what I did here was I worked at a company called Timet, Titanium Metals, and I spent eight wonderful years um, in Henderson, Nevada. Uh, I actually also picked up um, my co-worker, became my stepdad. Don't ask, it's like a long story, but it's kind of funny. Um, and that's all we made is titanium ingots, you know, um, and then the ingots are converted to billet, bar, sheet and plate. And, and so those would be things like this. Um, and I was so into that. I, I just thought this is a dream come true. I can work with customers. Everybody loves titanium. This is great. And so um, one of the things that I learned at that job was public speaking. So I got no problem speaking to people because they forced me to teach a class called Tai 101, where I went out to everybody in the world, all my customers, and taught them what the difference of these different grades of titanium are, the different chemistries, where they're used. And so I've got different applications here. I've got me swinging a golf club. Um, so you don't dare show up to the golf course without a titanium driver these days. Here's me riding around the Las Vegas motor, motor speedway on a titanium bike that's made out of a grade nine. And here's me in front of the Denver Art Museum um, standing next to uh, panels of CP titanium, the same panels that can also be seen at uh, the Mandarin Oriental um, Hotel in Las Vegas. Actually, it's not Mandarin anymore. It's now a Hilton. Um, but you can if you go to Las Vegas, you can go straight up to the building and you can touch the titanium on the wall. I think that's incredible. So from there, um, I joined SpaceX. Actually, SpaceX were a customer of Time Ed, I want to say. And I did go there and gave them the uh, Time 101 class. And then here I met some incredible people. Uh, my um, really good friend, uh, Humna Khan. Um, you can see her holding hands with me as we're featured on a National Geographic video called Mars. I think we're in episode one, two, and six. I think I might be in season two as well, which I thought, I think I saw on Disney Plus the other day. Um, and I also got the chance to meet a female astronaut and then the author of the book, The Martian, Andy Weir, actually met him at a cubicle party at the Interplanetary Society in Pasadena. But those, um, you know, that experience was where I really started to do more work in additive and 3D printing. I did a lot of stuff for supplier quality on um, atomized, gas atomized powder and then looking at different processes for AM. And then I was at uh, Relativity Space. So that's the company that I just joined from. And so uh, I joined when the company was very small. Um, I was employee number 20, and I was also the first female employee there. So um, something that I'm pretty proud of. And there I was senior engineer for additive technology. So again, um, laser powder bed fusion, but also the Stargate process, which is WAN wire arc additive. And so, um, you know, it was my mission to go out into the universe and look for different uh, ways of doing things or finding suppliers and seeing what they could do, looking at different machines, different materials and, and all that kind of stuff. So I really enjoyed my time there. It was um, it was great as a startup. I think the startup life is not for everyone, but I, I kind of enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, I found myself on on TV a lot, but that's also how I came across women in 3D printing. 
and I really started to get more involved in this wonderful organization which helps support women and girls and um, STEM activities. We At Relativity, we did a lot of stuff to support the middle school girls as well, particularly middle school girls of color. And so with the link between Relativity and USC, the Turby School, um, we did a lot of like a, a kind of volunteer work for schools and things like that. But I want to say that um, women in 3D printing really changed my life because it introduced me to all these amazing people and amazing networks. And, um, uh, you know, I think it's, it's just so important. So now I've got a new year. Uh, we're January 2021 and there's a new opportunity. So I just joined Trump literally like six weeks ago. So I can't tell you how it's going yet because it's still very new. But um, the idea to work on the machine manufacturing side is quite different from being an end user. So I like to see the different parts of the supply chain from being the materials manufacturer to being the spaceship OEM where I never thought I would work for for a spaceship company and now to being somewhere in the middle of the chain by being a machine manufacturer. So that's all very cool. Um, I've been able to carry on my public speaking. So if you are interested in soccer or what we call football in UK, um, I appear unpaid on a show on NBC Sports called uh, Fan Zone. You can also find it on their app. In other countries, I think it's broadcast on different networks. Um, it might be B in sports in other parts of the world. And um, so with that, I've been able to participate in things like um, representing more female fans and encouraging the female fans to speak up a little bit more and to have a little bit more diversity and representation in, in that area. And then just connecting more with wonderful people at um, in Southern California, but all over women in 3D printing. Sometimes we do kind of video chats, which we have, and then we put those on YouTube. And so you can kind of follow us on those kind of activities. So um, I think that all in all, you know, I want to say I went from like the lowest point of my life to, and obviously lots of people have low points in their lives, but I've managed to change that and turn that around and make that into something amazing and positive. And um, yeah, I, I moved from the traditional metalworking world into the additive 3D printing world. And I've seen the tremendous, you know, change in, you know, the industry, but also the mentality. And so that, that's the kind of thing that really keeps me going and motivating. And, you know, during the time of COVID, uh, you know, last summer probably was a pretty bad time for lots of people economically. And people reached out to me for help. Um, how can I rewrite my resume? How can I approach doing the same thing that you did, moving from the traditional world to the additive world and what all that takes? Like, what classes do I take or what kind of things do I have to learn? Who are the right people to speak to? That's a, that's a huge one. And then how can I make myself really open to embrace new technologies? And I think that's really important for companies, too, because if you are of the mindset where you can say, OK, my company is trying to achieve this or I'm trying to do this and I have to go after this technology or this thing over here, how do I do that? And then how do I understand it so that I can translate that to people in, in the company? And if you can do that, that's a pretty valuable task. So anyway, uh, I hope that you enjoyed that. This is very quick. I think we have a couple minutes for questions. But yeah, otherwise, um, you know, enjoy the rest of the conference. All righty. Great. So Q&A time. We have a cup. Well, we have a decent amount of questions for you, Ellie. So we'll see how many we can get through in the six minutes that we have left for your block. So the first question that people are really eager to hear about is being the first women, woman at relativity space, did you feel the need to set a standard with your male coworkers or did you feel pressure to outperform them? Uh, okay, clarification, I was the first female engineer. So there was a woman before me, so that was Ruby. So shout out to Ruby because she was the only female for over 13 months. So uh, that was when the company was maybe like five people. So she did all of that. She was like the office manager. She was very involved in creating the company, setting things up. 
booking meeting rooms, booking contractors, all that kind of stuff. But from a technical point of view, yeah, I felt like, hey, you know, so here's what I, I so I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I actually applied for a different role. And then I thought, hmm, I've only got like 50% of the requirements. Let me try it anyway. And then when I got in there, I said, you know, here are the things that I can do. And then here are things that I think you guys are missing that I can also do. And so I actually offered them more or slightly different than what they thought they were looking for. And so in that way, I show, I demonstrated my enormous value, <laughs> you know, but, but I think, um, yeah, you do feel a bit pressure, but if you know your stuff and you're confident, you're going to be all right because you are right. You're going to be okay. All right. So we have a question for you from Steph Cayley. Excuse me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, but Ellie, do you have any recommendations on welding 3D printed parts to other materials, e.g. titanium to stainless steel? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. So if you go back to fundamentals, it's basic, you're basically doing dissimilar welding. So I don't want to get too de technical into it, but honestly, if you approach those kind of joining situations just like you would traditional welding, then you can do that. I mean, it's it's not recommended. They always say not recommended. I think I feel like 3D printing metals is the offspring of casting and welding. So if you kind of get those kind of fundamentals and you, you look in a lot of welding manuals and, you, and then people say, well, I have a dissimilar metal join. Uh, how do I join this? You can join it. You need to maybe do some things to change the surface or maybe you need a buttering layer or maybe you need some kind of intermediate and not everything can be welded just the same way. Not everything can be 3D printed, even if you want to. If the input stock doesn't exist, you can't do it. If the process doesn't work, you can't do it. So as much as you want to 3D print a, a, a whole rocket, sometimes you just can't do it. So you do what you can and you do what makes sense at the time. And you don't just do it because it's cool or you actually like in one of the speakers this morning was uh, was talking about design 4 a.m. The part should be designed 4 a.m. So you need to make sure the process works, the material works and that it makes sense. Um, I'm still waiting for a couple of 3D printing processes for parts on spacecraft that I know nobody can do right now in full size. And if someone would do that, that would be an enormous opening to opening up space flight to more people because customers and space tourists and people can access that if only though. So I could go on but you can come and find me later on in the chat. There we go, I love that, thank you so much. So, next question, let's see here. Ooh, we got two at the top, they're equal. I'm trying to decide which ones are good. So, Cynthia Rogers asks, can you share why some of the women characters in The Expanse are so inspiring to you? You have a great Oh my God, thank you, thank you so much. I love The Expanse. If you have not watched The Expanse, it is a, uh, adaptation of a series of books by uh, James S. A. Corey, who is a them, not a he. Um, but they have written a future view of the world where humans live on Earth, Mars, and the asteroid belt, and loads of like little colonies in between, like Luna and so on. The female characters in that show are immense. They are realistic. They are fantastic. They're so diverse. And they're natural. It's not like they were forced to be uh, divert. Like we've got to have an Asian character in here. We've got to have an African character. No, it's just they are just people, and they are just doing. And they are kicking it. They are crushing it. Please watch the expanse. The first two episodes are a bit hard to get through, but once you get through that, because it's so rewarding. And I have not seen a depiction of life in outer space that is so realistic and plausible the physics are super plausible it is absolutely immense i could go on find me in the chat <laughs> all right you sold me out right. i'm gonna have to go and watch that now after type with all my free time okay well we are just at the at, well for me we're just coming up to the hour mark at noon here on the east coast but 
You've been a great speaker, Ellie. So thank you so much for sharing your personal journey and being so open with the audience as well with the difficult times in your life. I know for a fact for me, it's really inspired me to kind of come to have that come to Jesus moment, if you will, and understand, you know, what? like sometimes it's okay to ask for help and figure out where you need to go. So thank you so much for that. I do appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. And everybody enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, come and find me in the chat. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Maddie, for the opportunity and enjoy the rest of the speakers in the youth track. I love that. Enjoy the speakers in the youth track and watch the expanse. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Ellie. You're free to turn off your camera and mic.